I'd say do it for the right reasons. Um, and I'm not saying there is a right or wrong reason. I'm just saying there needs to be a, there, there are right or wrong reasons for you. Um, and there are certain things that going into and, and building a small business or startup um, are, are more likely to make you happy and feel fulfilled along the way. Because the, the one thing that's, that's absolutely certainty is that you're going to have a lot of ups and downs and probably a lot more downs early on, right? Like the, the companies that just take off and accelerate, I mean, those are the exceptions. There, there's a reason they're the exceptions. For 99% of people who start a business, you're going to have a lot more downs in the early days than you are ups. Um, and, and frankly, I think, you know, that's probably generally true overall, but they become more manageable as you grow um, and as you mature. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great uh, guest on the podcast, Greg Macbeth. And uh, Greg started up his uh, journey, or started out his journey uh, growing up in uh, San Diego. Uh, went to college and wanting to become an astronomer and going to astrophysics and then talked with some uh, people in the field and decided to go different directions. So uh, went into mechanical and aerospace engineering, um, wasn't sure what he wanted to do. And so as he was uh, figuring all that out, also uh, got into playing poker for a while um, and did that as a, a full-time uh, poker player for about a year and a half. And then afterwards uh, got into the world of sales, uh, liked the uh, technical and interpersonal aspects of sales. Uh, wanted to do his own business and uh, wanted uh, uh, or was uh, part of an educational startup. And then uh, that educational startup got sold in 2020. Um, and so with that, uh, started to, or started working for a few other consulting businesses, made a move to Napa and uh, started his business, which is what he's doing now. So with that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Greg. Thanks, Devin. So, so I just gave a quick overview to a much longer journey. So why don't we uh, rewind and unpack that a bit? So tell us a little bit about uh, how your journey got uh, started uh, growing up in San Diego. Yeah, well, my <clears throat> my dad was in the Navy. So we moved around a lot when I was a lot younger. And we ended up in San Diego. He was stationed at Miramar. So I went to middle school there, went to high school there. Um, you know, did pretty well academically. Uh, did pretty well in sports, uh, was somewhat socially awkward until I got to, <laughs> let's say, 11th or 12th grade. Um, so, you know, it was obviously at that point spending a lot of my time studying and, and kind of focusing on what my next uh, stage in the college journey was going to look like. Um, I, I was very drawn to science, drawn to mathematics. And so that, that's the area where I decided that I wanted to focus. And um, yeah, really just spent a lot of my, my time in science and math classes. It kind of ignored the rest, uh, but was still able to graduate and uh, moved on. So, no, it makes sense. So now you, you jumped in or, or went there. So backing up just a little bit, you started out yeah. in uh, wanting to be an astronomer, going into astrophysics, and then walk mm -hmm. us through kind of, you started there, but that's not where you ended up. And in, in the middle of all that, you went and played poker for a while. So walk us through kind of uh, what or, or that aspect of the journey. Yeah, well, I mean, I knew there, I wouldn't say I knew this consciously at the time, but uh, subconsciously, I knew that I, I needed something that was both technical and social uh, to feel fulfilling. Uh, I didn't, you know, as, uh, as I guess, sort of introverted as I guess I would claim that I, I was and still am, um, you know, I really valued a lot of the friendships and relationships that I had. And, and, I, and I found that that gave me a lot of energy to pursue the things that were more uh, isolated and, and exclusionary uh, with respect to social interaction. And so uh, when I when I got to college, I started talking and, and um, trying to learn a little bit more about what a career in astrophysics was actually going to look like. And the, what I quickly learned after talking to people who were in that field was that most of the time that you spend is doing one of two things. You're either in front of a computer crunching data or you're kissing the government's ass for grant funding. Um, and neither of those seem particularly attractive. So uh, after uh, after those conversations, realized that I wanted to do something a little bit differently. Um, poker was something that I kind of 
just haphazardly came across, um, you know, I, 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 that was back in what, 2003. So poker was kind of taking off, uh, you know, the Chris Moneymaker, uh, who's the, the famous accountant from Tennessee who won the World Series poker main event, um, got in on a satellite, right, won a couple million dollars. That really ignited the poker boom. And so everyone, I feel like everyone in college at that point was starting to play. Um, and pretty quickly found that I can make some good money doing that. Uh, I didn't really think about it as a potential career of any sort until um, I was going to go to spring break and found myself with only a couple hundred dollars in my bank account and said, all right, well, you know, it's next week. I'm going to go see if I can uh, parlay this into a, uh, a decent sum of money. Um, so I ended up playing like a 30 hour session, um, you know, turned that couple hundred dollars into like 10 grand and said, hey, uh, this seems like something I could potentially do. And it sounds a lot more attractive than spending 120 hours a week working at a, a banking firm or consulting firm, which frankly, I probably wasn't going to do anyway, because at that point, my grades weren't that good, because um, I was spending a lot of my time playing poker instead of going to class. Um, so that ended up uh, becoming something I wanted to focus on uh, the day after I graduated college, um, you know, much to my parents' excitement. Um, I'm kind of joking. They're actually very supportive. Uh, but you know, I uh, drove down to Vegas, packed my car full of all my belongings at that time, which wasn't very much. Um, ended up sleeping in the parking lot of the Flamingo Hotel because um, you know, I didn't have an apartment yet. Um, slept for a couple hours. When the leasing office opened, I went to a place that was just off the strip, got an apartment, and then ended up spending the next year and a half kind of going between the Bellagio and the Commerce Casino in LA and playing, uh, you know, ten to twelve hours a day. No, so that sounds like uh, quite the journey. Going from being an astronomer to a, a full time poker player is a is a different path than uh, many often take. And so, now, how long did you did you uh, were you in Vegas, or how long did you to play uh, poker full time for? Yeah, I mean, I didn't stay in Vegas actually that long. Um, I found that I was going to LA a lot, which is where most of my friends were anyway. And and actually, the action in LA was just as good, if not better, than Vegas. And so I was going back and forth a lot. And since my friends were all there and, and, you know, they were coming and meeting me anyway in Vegas, I ended up going to L.A. and spent about a year there doing this full time. Um, you know, it was I, so I did a full time for about a year and a half. It was um, it was a really fun experience. I mean, you know, living 22 in Vegas <laughs> uh, was pretty amazing for all the reasons you would expect. Um, but it also didn't drive a lot of uh, personal discipline, I guess is a nice way that I would put it. Uh, and so uh, moving to LA was, was, I think, a good next step, um, you know, but eventually it just got kind of boring, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, I do have some friends that, that actually played caught within college and are still full-time players. Some of them, uh, one of them in particular became one of the best 10 players in the world, I would say, for, for a time. Um, and you know, it just requires a level of dedication and grind that I just at that point didn't have. And so I found that I actually enjoyed it a lot more and actually made more money when I would do it as a side hustle, just because it allowed me to focus on something else. And then I could really play more for the enjoyment, um, and focus on the, the key things I needed to make money. But, um, yeah, it was, it, it was a great experience and, uh, certainly would do it again if I, if I had to do it all over. No. Sounds like it was a fun experience. Got a or, or, or get a unique experience in life and uh, do that for a while. So now did that for a period of time. Now, what made you decide to to leave the world of poker and go into sales? Yeah, well, sales was uh, was I, actually after poker. I moved to an aerospace engineering job, um, which you know it was kind of I, I, at the time I was I thought, well, what can I use my degree for? Just gonna hire someone who just came out of a poker background. Um, so aerospace engineering seemed kind of like a, a no brainer. Did that for about two years. It was absolutely as boring as I as I expected it was going to be. It was this, you know what you, what I thought it would be right, which is sitting in the uh, sitting in front of a computer, crunching numbers and writing programs to analyze that. And so after I had an opportunity to get out of there, um, an ex-girlfriend of mine had introduced me to this technical sales training program that Cisco uh, was running on the East Coast. So I jumped at the opportunity to do that. It seemed like a kind of a great fit, mix of engineering, mix of sales, uh, got to go with a bunch of kind of young people, young, smart people who were doing some um, doing an interesting career. And then I, I would get placed somewhere in the country afterwards in a full-time gig that was paying pretty well um, as someone who was still at that point, you know, three years out of college. So uh, I ended up doing that, moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, went through the sales training program, uh, which was which was kind of like a, another year of college, frankly. Uh, I met some of my you know, still best friends who I still hang out with today. Yeah, it was an awesome experience, learned a ton, uh, learned how to sell, 
and then was placed in the field um, in a couple different locations before working, eventually working for one of their major partners, managing all the big Silicon Valley accounts out in San Francisco. So um, was running the accounts for Google and Facebook and Apple. Um, and that was about the time when I realized that you know I had the baseline skill set, I had the technical acumen, I had the sales training, and I, I knew that I wanted to move into something that was a little bit more entrepreneurial. And that led me to find the education startup, uh, which was done through a friend of a friend. And uh, yeah, that was off to the races from there. Cool. Well, sounds like it was a, a good, or a good uh, gr- or training ground uh, to get some uh, additional good uh, skill sets. Now, I think that uh, from the the sales positions and working in that world for a period of time, you decided to switch gears a bit or kind of go more towards a startup world and uh you say so you went uh, and uh, did a, a startup with the educational company node is that right no so that was uh that was uh later so the educational startup was called bloomboard okay uh, it was focused on teacher training and development um it was a great experience uh but one thing that was really tough just generally about that space and this somewhat translates to what i'm doing today is education is extremely political it's extremely highly regulated and so and the speed at which the industry operates is, is it's just slow, right? It's not what you expect going to any other area of uh, technological development. And so the ability for us to innovate and iterate and also have a level of stability with which to build a company, uh, those were challenges that we were facing that other companies in the tech space just weren't. And so you, you kind of have a couple choices there. So one, you can either key off of something that's probably not likely to change over time. Um, you know, depending upon who's in political power, who runs a DOE, et cetera. But then you're typically not able to make as big of an impact because the things that will have the biggest impact, like infrastructure, instruction, et cetera, those are all things that are heavily politically driven for better or worse. And so to be able to impact those things requires a level of dynamism that's just really tough uh, when you don't have that long-term time horizon that you can key your business off to. And so it ended up taking a while for that business to figure out what uh, ultimately needed to be done um, to make something that was sustainable and potentially profitable. It ended up taking about four years, frankly. Um, They they really just kind of got to a place where they were figuring that out uh, right as the time that I I realized I needed to to move on to something different. And so I ended up moving to Crunchbase after that, you know, which was kind of a good switch just to see how things worked in an alternative universe focused on big data and then um, use that big data experience and uh, move to move over to Node. And Node was an AI-focused startup. It went through a couple iterations as well, but eventually became an AI startup. Uh, this is pre-chat GPT, obviously, and it was focused on using people and company-level data to figure out which customers were likely to be most profitable, which ones were likely to churn. Um, and I so I led the, the business development and sales team there for about three years. Um, I left in 2019, um, and then was consulting for about a year prior to starting Melier. Um, and then that company sold to Sugar CRM, which is one of Salesforce's larger competitors. Um, back, they sold in 2020, and it's now their core AI product. No, that's cool. So now, or rewind or unpack this a little bit. So you started a business, started Melier, and uh, and then uh, walk us through a little bit. What is that business? What did you do? And you said it was sold off. So help us understand where you're at today. Yeah. Um, well, so after Node, I, I knew that I wanted to do something myself. Um, so I was early at, or I was early at Node, um, and I knew that I wanted to do something myself. but didn't really have an idea that was sticky, and so ended up um, consulting for a couple of different early stage startups, helping them with fundraising. That that sort of zero to one phase, like setting up sales processes, hiring. Um, fundraising, things like that. Still do that today, actually. Um, it's, it's kind of a nice nice way to stay connected to the ecosystem. But that was my full focus for about a year and a half. And then um, the idea started to creep in my mind for Melier. Um, and obviously it wasn't called Melier at the time, but um, you know, I'd been a wine consumer, kind of a reluctant wine lover, to be honest with you, uh, for, for a while. And then finally in, into my mid thirties or so, really just started to fall in love with wine. Um, and my you know, wife and I were coming up to Napa very frequently. We lived in San Francisco and then Marin, so it was an easy trek. And just, I don't know, I, I don't really know how to describe the fact that I just sort of fell in love with the place and um, wine itself, uh, the totality of the experience. Uh, but one of the things that I frequently noticed was that 
the places and the products that I loved the most were often the ones that were, were very difficult to find at restaurants. They were difficult to find on store shelves. Um, and, and they wouldn't show up when you searched on Google. It was, it was sort of those things where you had to be in the know. Um, and the recommendations I would get for a lot of my favorite spots were through word of mouth and people that I trusted. And it was it stuck with me that given just the sort of the plethora of, of different technological recommendation search systems in play, why is it that so many of these amazing boutique wineries and wines uh, simply aren't showing up to the average consumer? Um, and, and so that became a problem that I became really interested in, started to dig a little bit into. And all of that coalesced into Melier when I when I moved to Napa. So I, we already, my wife and I, uh, right when COVID hit, said, hey, look, let's live where we want to live. We were in a, a nice place in Marin, but it was kind of a shoebox when you were working from home, both of us. Mm-hmm. And so we moved in a place in Napa, got more a lot more space for less money, which seemed like a no-brainer. We used to live in Napa. Um, and uh, yeah, I met uh, my now co-founder, Dan, who runs uh, Cubezon and Brandlin Wineries. And was telling them about what I was experiencing as a consumer. And so we ended up having a 30 minute, what was supposed to be a 30 minute meeting in his office ended up being almost five hours. And we traced the whole history or he traced it for me because I had no idea what I was talking about at that point. The whole history of the wine industry from prohibition to today. And so I got to get a really good sense as to why the industry is structured the way that it is and where the opportunity sits uh, to make a difference and impact from a technical order pretty different perspective nope oh, there we go we just uh had a a slight uh or hiccup in the the internet and greg is back and uh caught the, the the very or the vast majority of that so now you get into the wine industry kind of go into it you know, you say reluctantly, but then, uh, or reluctantly as far as be, or getting into wine, but uh, then uh, go uh, a full bore on that. Now, I think that uh, you said, you mentioned that that business is sold or now you've kind of evolved to, to where you're at today. Yeah. Um, so, no, so we haven't sold the business. Um, so we started out focusing on building an e-commerce platform for the wine industry. And one of the things that we learned pretty quickly was that, it's very much like education. Um, you are fundamentally dealing with a very human driven industry. Um, you know, what people like, um, uh, obviously that's, that's hard to capture in technology. Um, now that with some AI advances that's shifting a little bit, but, um, there's still a, both a subjective and an objective, um, or, or qualitative and quantitative, if you prefer that route way that people do or do not enjoy wine. And, and so things like, um, you know, the fact that if you go to a tasting room and drink wine A, um, you are likely to spend four to five times as much money as you are if you experience drink that same wine in a different setting. Um, so it's not just a pure, you know, I buy this from, I don't, it's not a widget in that sense. Mm-hmm. And so that lends itself to a world in which, you know, relationships um, you know, the quality of the overall experience that drives a lot of sales in a way that it's not necessarily true for other industries. And what that meant is that trying to build a, a kind of pure e-commerce type platform um, wasn't likely to move the needle. I mean, there are platforms in play in this space. Uh, some of them are implemented to varying degrees of success. Um, but ultimately, the power of this industry is getting your product in the hands of people who uh, are likely to enjoy it and doing that in a way that's compelling, right? So through stories, through people, through conversation. And so that sort of shifted and especially with COVID and, and how COVID shifted across not just uh, you know the world, but across differently across different states um, made it very difficult for the first year and a half or so to get any real meaningful data around what's going to be compelling. And, and so we had to test out a couple different concepts and um, ultimately found that, you know, kind of as you would expect, right, as I've already alluded to, you know, getting wine in people's hands was the best way to make an impact. And so then our focus and now our focus today is entirely around how do we get as much wine in front of people as possible and do that scalably um, through a combination of people and technology. And that's where our focus today. Awesome. Well, sounds like it was a, 
a good opportunity and uh, one that uh, sounds like it was a good journey to figure out kind of uh, how you make that impact and how you can uh, provide that uh, that value add uh, both for for the the wine business that you're in as well as for helping others that are in that so that uh, sounds like it's a great uh, great business a fun place to be so with that, now as we kind of reach the uh, present day of your journey, great time to transition to the two questions I always ask at the end of each uh, episode. So we'll jump to those now. So the first question I'd like to ask is, along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made? And what did you learn from it? The worst decision I made was when uh, was thinking that uh, easy venture money would last for longer than it did or making the assumption that it would last for a particular period of time. Um, you know, it's very interesting when capital is cheap, how people collectively make decisions and where people get influenced to spend their capital. Um, you know, so we were, when I, when I, when I first got Melier funded, uh, this was back in 2021. Um, and we had a great venture partner. Uh, that, that's been super supportive the entire way. Um, but what's interesting is when you talk to just broadly people in the space, right? I saw this is not just me. I've, I've seen this with tons and tons of different companies. When they raise money and things are going great and everything's moving up and to the right, right? It's all about growth, 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 growth. And the reality is for our space, um, you know, we are limited somewhat in our ability to grow at the speed of, of the, the industry itself. Um, you know, that now you can certainly move fast and break things, right? I, I don't want to necessarily say you have to move at the speed of whatever industry you're in, but there are certain constraints in place and especially in a place that's as heavily regulated like this. I mean, there's a reason that, for instance, a lot of startups don't do healthcare, right? Because it's extremely regulated. Well, mm -hmm. you know, alcohol is not as regulated as healthcare, but it's pretty highly regulated. Um, and so, and it differs from state to state. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of constraints in terms of how you can grow. And so growing effectively is a lot more important. Um, and I was not as diligent about that early on as I probably should have been looking back in retrospect. Um, and so, you know, now where capital is a lot more difficult and where we've also focused in a place that, you know, broadly I think is less likely to get funded rather right? when we're really targeted within the wine space, it requires us to be a lot more thoughtful of how we spend our money. And that, honestly, it's been a great, I think it's been a great thing for us because we've been, had to be much more specific about what's going to move the needle and what's not. No, sounds like it's uh, a, a good, uh, you know, it's one where it's, you know, a good mistake to learn from, but it's an easy one to make in the sense that, you know, first of all, you see all the TV shows and the books and the movies and everybody always goes gets venture capital and it's the money range from the sky and everybody's rich and it may, you know, accelerates the business. You know, one of the things is, is to, uh, whether or not it, even in some businesses, it can be helpful, can be, you know, at a, a great acceleration, um, but it may not be every time right for the business, not the right for the right timing, might not where it brings on a different set of responsibilities and changes the, the scope of the business. And so I think that understanding that and uh, be able to make the right decision is a lot easier said than done and, uh, and, and certainly gives you an opportunity to make mistakes and learn from them. So that uh, sounds great. Second question now that I ask is now, if you talk to somebody that's just getting into a startup or a small business, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give them? I would say do it for the right reasons. Um, and I'm not saying there is a right or wrong reason. I'm just saying there needs to be a, there, there are right or wrong reasons for you. Um, and there are certain things that going into and, and building a small business or startup um, are, are more likely to make you happy and feel fulfilled along the way, because the, the one thing that's that's absolutely certainty is that you're going to have a lot of ups and downs and probably a lot more downs early on, right? Like the, the companies that just take off and accelerate, I mean, those are the exceptions. There, there's a reason they're the exceptions. For 99% of people who start a business, you're going to have a lot more downs in the early days than you are ups. Um, and, and frankly, I think, you know, that's probably generally true overall, but they become more manageable as you grow um, and as you mature. And so, you know, if you're going to start a company, do it because you, let's say, are super passionate about a particular space. Do it because you really value your autonomy. Um, do it because you think you can make an impact, that, right? And you, and you want to work really hard. Um, don't do it because it sounds sexy or don't do it because you think you're going to get rich off of it, right? Again, like the, the number of people that, that experience that, it's, it's very small. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're going in with that mindset, you're much more likely to be disappointed and not being able to weather uh, the ups and downs. No, and I think that's a great takeaway. And, you know, again, it goes almost back to a little bit the first one, which is, you know, 
even venture capitalists or just uh, business in general, you know, you get, I think sometimes you get a false sense of here's what a business is. And if I get into business, it's going to work out great. And I'm going to be rich and I'm going to be like the people in the movies that worked uh, an hour a day and then uh, get to go and play for the rest of the time. And I, uh, to your point, I think there's a lot more ups and downs that can be very rewarding. Have a, you can get a lot of, you know, or, or feed or a lot of uh, accomplish a lot of things and, and can be very successful, but you have to definitely prepare, be prepared for those ups and downs. So I think that's uh, definitely makes sense. And it's a great takeaway. Yeah. And just to add to that, um, you know, so I mean, I, so within my social circle of my wife's social circle, I mean, a lot of people who start a lot of companies and some of them have had really, you know, impressive outcomes, right. Um, you know, nine, 10 figure outcomes. Um, and what's interesting when you talk to folks like that, um, one, they're all still working every single one. Um, I, no one's sitting on a beach somewhere and just relaxing and, and granted, like, I'm sure there are people that do that, but that gets old really quickly. And so the stuff that drives people, that tends to be a lot more fundamental. And if you're not aware of that, then it's very easy to, to get into a situation. And I've seen this with some of my people and one friend in particular where, you know, had, had a big success really early and then really struggled to figure out like what his motivations were. Um, and a lot of, a lot of his anxiety came down to trying to replicate that early success is the, is the really enjoying the journey. And I, and I used to hate it when my dad would always tell me it's about the journey, not the destination, but for something like starting a small business, if it's not about the journey, if you're not, in, if you're not there to enjoy and experience that process and learn from that process, you will be miserable. It doesn't matter what type of outcome you have at the end of the day. No, I think that, uh, that, uh, is uh, definitely a great takeaway. So. Awesome. Well, with that, now as we uh, do wrap up the episode, if people are wanting to reach out to you, out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all yeah. of the above. What's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? Yeah, you can just email me to Greg, Greg uh, directly, Greg G R E G at melier.com, M E L I E R dot com. Um, if you're interested in, if you come to wine country. Uh, and you're interested in uh, setting up with tastings or transportation or whatever it is, you want to host something with your home or office, or if you're interested in joining a bespoke high-end wine club, uh, feel free to reach out. Same thing if you're interested in, uh, we are looking for folks who are um, you know, potentially interested in hosting tastings in different markets. So if you have a wine background or interest, we will offer training around that. Um, and certainly, you know, we are, we're not actively fundraising today, but we will, you know, we'll certainly consider it for the right person. All right. Well, definitely uh, a lot of uh, great options. Uh, definitely um, re or, or encourage you to reach out, support a great business. And if nothing else, uh, make a new best friend. So with that, thank you again, Greg, for uh, coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Now for all of you, the listeners are out there. If you have your own journey to share and you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, we'd love to have you. So just go to inventiveguest.com. Apply to be on the show. A couple more things as listeners, make sure to click share, subscribe, and leave us a review. Helps us to, uh, or, or helps us to share the journeys and uh, help even more startups and small businesses along their journey to success. And on that note, if you ever need help with your startup, or your small business along your journey with patents or trademarks, feel free to go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat. We're always here to help. Well, thank you again, Greg, for coming on the podcast and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thanks, Devin. Appreciate it.